As we do every week, it's time to speak to one of the finest thinkers of his generation, the best-selling author of groundbreaking works, including The War on the West, The Strange Death of Europe, and The Madness of Crowds. Douglas Murray, we have a lot to discuss today, from the tyranny of the minority to sleeping beauty. But let's start with another Trump indictment, this time in Georgia. We have spoken in recent months about the dangers of the Justice Department becoming weaponized to attack a political candidate. And we've seen this in the justice system over and over again, what are considered by many to be bogus charges. And I think this week's developments help explain why only two in 10 Americans have a great deal of confidence in the US Justice Department. And among Republicans, Douglas, the figure is even less. That's right, Rita. I mean, it's a very, very dangerous corner for America, this, isn't it? I mean, I mean, the, the, the indictments against Trump are obviously, I mean, they're obviously sort of uh, coming one by one. There's a sort of drip feed of them. And I think the hope uh, of Trump's opponents in the Republican Party as well as in the Democrat Party is that they're going to just mount up. The irrespective of whether or not any one of them leads to actual prosecution, there's just going to be such a, um, a mountain of them uh, by the time the primary season really begins uh, that you know voters are just going to be turned off. But here's the, the complexity of that corner. Mm -hmm. A new poll out today shows Trump in even more of a lead in the Republican field than he's been to date. And so, so the question really is, like, why is there no impact uh, from these uh, mounting indictments? And I think it goes to what you've just said, Rita, that there is just such distrust, particularly among Republican voters, of the idea that justice in America today is actually blind. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, we saw that uh, early on with the very first indictment with the, those FBI raids over the, uh, the documents, uh, because at that time, DeSantis and Trump were neck and neck. And as soon as that occurred, Trump shot ahead and DeSantis is really uh, trailing him terribly. It's hard to yes. see how he's going to make up that ground. Now, let's remind folk of who the foreperson of that special grand jury in Georgia was. But honestly, I kind of wanted to subpoena the former president because I got to swear everybody in. Mm. And so I thought it'd be really cool to get 60 seconds with President Trump of me looking at him and being like, do you solemnly swear? And me getting to swear him in, I just, I kind of just thought that would be an awesome moment. Oh dear, that was Emily Kors, the uh, Georgia grand jury four person. Now, moving along to another presidential candidate, another outsider, Vivek Ramaswamy, who gave a masterclass in how to handle the LGBTQIA lobby. Here he is confronted by a pansexual reporter, Watch this interaction. I am personally a pansexual, so I was okay. just wondering what your views on same-sex couples were. I don't have a negative view of same-sex couples, but I do have a negative view of a tyranny of the minority. So, so I think that in the name of protecting against a tyranny of the majority, and there are times in this country's history where we have had a tyranny of the majority, we have now, in the name of protecting against tyranny of the majority, created a new tyranny of the minority. And I think that that's wrong. I don't think that somebody who's religious should be forced to officiate a wedding that they disagree with. I don't think somebody who is a woman who's worked really hard for her achievements should be forced to compete against a biological man in a swim competition. I don't think that somebody who's a woman that respects her bodily autonomy and dignity should be forced to change clothes in a locker room with a man. That's not freedom, that's oppression. And Douglas, he went on to explain why this tyranny of the minority is particularly dangerous for children. How did you see that uh, encounter? I thought it was fascinating, Rita. Firstly, because uh, this uh, per this uh, person says, woman saying, I'm a pansexual. She's is probably used to that making people bow down to her as a sort of <laughs> goddess, Gaia-like figure. You know, oh, pansexual, oh, how interesting you must be. Oh, my. And, of course, she's also used to the fact that, that really saying that at the opening is a type of way to try to make the person who is your interlocutor into your hostage. I'm a pansexual. 
you know, what have you got to say about that? And you're, you're, she's hoping that the politicians are going to go, uh, 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 I can't believe you love everything, like, uh, want to have sex with trees, whatever, pansexuals have mean this week, uh, sure. Uh, they just hope that it's going to make them into a hostage. And Vivek Ramaswamy is far too clever for that. Uh, uh, I know him. I've done events with him. I've spoken with him. On many occasions, he's very smart. And what he did there was expert, in my opinion, expert in making sure he wasn't taken hostage by this clear political activist. Um, uh, secondly, by explaining the problem that he has, and, and basically the majority of us have with this w weird uh, alphabet soup clown car thing. Uh, and thirdly, by doing so in a courteous manner. It's something very interesting about Brahmaswamy. He's thought his way through all of these issues. He's got a very clear way of explaining things. And as long as somebody is courteous to him, he's courteous back. Mm. And it's very interesting that somebody who's such an outsider when he started is now number three in the polls and catching up with DeSantis fast. It's astonishing how well he's done because as intelligent as he is, uh, uh, you think oh, he's got zero chance, but he's getting through and, and even that interaction ended on a lovely note with, with I think, the reporter. And by the way... Go on. And by the way, I should mention, uh, Rita, that when I was last on a stage with Vivek in, uh, in Washington earlier this year, I did say to him that I, I wanted the deal that I always ask of politicians, which is that if he does make it to president, I want a special portfolio in his government, which is Minister uh, of Education, Public Enlightenment and also War. <laughs> and War? <laughs> Not asking much, Douglas. Not asking I, much at all. I think it would add a certain. I think it would add a certain piquancy to my dealing with the teachers' unions. <laughs> I endorse this. I'm backing this a hundred percent. Now, Douglas, you've written about the Snow White controversy this week, and Disney have lost a fortune by backing stupidly woke productions, but they're doing it again. What's the definition of madness again? And with Snow White, the lead actress has been described as a walking PR disaster. You know, the, the original cartoon came out in 1937, yeah. and very evidently so. <laughs> it's really not about the love story at all, which is really, really wonderful. And whether or not she finds love along the way is anybody's guess. Douglas, I'm not sure she understands the, uh, the depths of the themes behind fairy tales, but she seems to have utter contempt for the Snow White story. Yeah, that's right. I mean, uh, um, it seems that the PR strategy of Disney is to ruin all classic uh, movies uh, <laughs> and all classic cartoons and uh, it, and claim they're all dated whilst offering us these horribly dated cliches. Uh, basically, uh, the actress in question uh, is, 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 is just peeing all over the 1937 cartoon version that's so loved by people and saying things like, uh, she said in an interview, uh, don't expect the, the, her to wait for the prince. Uh, there may not even be a prince. There is, mm. He's in the recording, but he may be edited out. And the reason, she said, is, is that the real story of Snow White apparently is that, that, that Snow White can become the leader she's meant to be. <laughs> and uh, apart from the fact, by the way, interestingly enough, Rita, that sounds like a script written by Meghan Markle. Uh, who, of course, actually did uh, wait for the prince or indeed rushed at a prince and uh, grabbed him for her own use. But that aside, uh, w what's clearly happening with this is this, this terrible attempt to sort of update everything. And what they don't realise is that the updating they're doing already sounds much more dated. You know, mm. the 1937 cartoon of Snow White will be ageless. Uh, this nonsense already sounds aged to me at any rate. And uh, I can't wait for this to be yet another Disney box office bomb. And as I've said before, why not just write a new story with these right. modern themes that you want to push? Uh, there's no reason to go and yep. trash a classic. You can I, actually write new I stories. <laughs> Absolutely. Why not, Rita? Here's an idea for Disney. Why don't they just do this thing of a princess in the castle who doesn't want a prince uh, and she becomes the woman she wants to be, which is a, a mid-level executive somewhere at the United Nations at First Avenue in New York, and she retires in her mid-50s and has a good uh, uh, retirement send-off from her colleagues, and that's the end. 
and she'd go home and live happily ever after with her cats and I think a lot of people would be yes. happy with that. Now to a movie <laughs> that we all loved, The Blind Side. Well, I certainly loved it. The true story of a homeless kid who becomes an NFL star after an affluent white family take him in. But Michael Orr is now suing that family, claiming the two is use their conservatorship to make millions in royalties from the film and he didn't earn a cent. As they say, Douglas, no good deed goes unpunished. I'm, I'm shocked. You know, Michael Orr's father abandoned him, his mother abandoned him, but he wants to paint the family that saved him as opportunistic monsters. Uh, as you say, Rita, in no good deed goes unpunished. It's a it's a quite extraordinary thing, and and perhaps it just comes this general age of entitlement that exists, where where if things don't go absolutely perfect as you think it should be in your life, you go rampaging through the past looking for people to blame. And that can even include the people who saved you. There's a very important insight somewhere here into, into, the, into human nature and what it is in our time that we're, we're telling people to expect from their lives. Well, there are now reports that Orr received 100000 from the movie, which was the same sum the other members of the family received. So it looks like none right. of them made a fortune from the blind not a bad side. Deal. Yeah. But it's, it's not uh, a bad I just, deal. Oh, well, I just think it's just so, I don't know, ungrateful. That if you're on the streets and a For family sure. saves you, and I don't know, perhaps he's gone and blown all that NFL money and now he's looking for a, perhaps another payday. Uh, Douglas Murray, thanks yes. for your time this evening. It's a great pleasure as always.